is July 21st, 1861, and right now we are walking in the footsteps of the 1st and 2nd Rhode Island Volunteer Infantry. And we're about to make contact with Confederate forces under the command of PGT Beauregard up here on Matthews Hill. We have the 4th South Carolina and the 1st Louisiana Infantry. And once we break this wood line, we'll begin exchanging volleys with those Confederate forces, thus igniting the first major battle of the American Civil War. So we're gonna dive into the first major battle and learn why dreams of a short and brief war were just that, dreams. They would be quickly erased here when the sun would set on this day. So on July 16th, 1861, the Union Army Commander, Irvin McDowell, and his raw and green recruits of 35,000, which at the time was the largest army ever assembled for the American forces. Um, they would leave Washington, D.C. under uh, grand illusions of a short and brief war. The streets would be filled with cheers, and they were headed here to Manassas Junction, which was a vital railway hub for Virginia and the newly formed Confederacy. If they can capture this railway junction, they would inhibit the uh, Confederacy's ability to move supplies and troops in and around Richmond and the Shenandoah Valley. So just to kind of orient you as to where we are right now, that is the wood line where we started. And this is the wood line where Irvin McDowell would launch a flanking attack on the morning of July 21st of 1861. His goal was to hit the Confederate flank here on Matthews Hill. So this would be the Confederate's left flank. And this is the wood line where the 1st and 2nd Rhode Island would emerge from along with a Rhode Island battery. And they would take a position on this ridge just before us here. Now, on paper, McDowell's plan was pretty good. But remember, this army was green, inexperienced, and communication at the time was extremely slow. Your word can only travel as, as fast as your courier could ride. And this plan that he came up with has a lot of moving parts. So in the early morning hours, McDowell and a force of about 20,000 would perform this flanking maneuver. Well, unfortunately, a large portion of McDowell's forces were 90-day volunteers, and many of those volunteers were coming, their enlistments were coming to an end. Um, they lacked discipline. They, they really weren't real soldiers. So progress was slow. Uh, they would break ranks the rest. They would break ranks to scavenge for food and pick berries. And when the Rhode Island regiments would finally emerge, McDowell wasn't able to utilize his superior numbers to overtake the Confederates. Um, the Confederates only had about a thousand soldiers manning this location at the time McDowell's forces would emerge from this wood line here. And we're approaching the Union position here on Matthews Hill. Wow, absolutely beautiful. Especially being from Florida, these rolling hills here are just awesome to see. I'm used to uh, sand dunes and palmetto thickets and uh, the highest elevation of Florida is about 10 feet so this is a uh, this is a nice change of pace but this is actually I mean I'm no military tactician but this seems like a pretty good position you have the high ground here and you have your artillery on the high ground and the Rhode Island infantry regiments would start taking up positions on the left flank here and as more regiments arrive they would fill in to the left of those infantry regiments and the Rhode Islanders would also have an artillery battery like you're seeing before us here. And in this direction, I want to say somewhere in, in this area here, the Confederates would be positioned uh, initially with skirmishers, but then they would have two uh, infantry regiments deployed here. I believe one was the 4th South Carolina and the 1st Louisiana Infantry. So we've moved down a little bit down the Union line here. So here's the Rhode Island battery where we started. And I want you to take a look at these. Check out these weird looking uh, howitzers here. And these have a pretty interesting story, believe it or not. These are two 12 pound boat howitzers. Now they would take on the name Dahlgren howitzers because one of the first units to muster for service and answer Lincoln's call for volunteers was the 71st New York State Militia. And they help protect the Union Navy Yard near DC and also uh, participated in several raids up and down the Potomac River and as a gift to the New York State Militia here uh, Captain John Dahlgren of the United States Navy presented the 71st New York State Militia here with these two boat howitzers and they were wheeled here by hand by Company I of the 71st New York State Militia and each man carried two rounds on his person so these are 12 pound howitzers. So that's an additional 24 pounds per soldier. 
and uh, they would be wheeled to this position next to the Rhode Island battery and they would be aimed and fired at the Confederate forces. <laughs> I've never seen a few artillery pieces that not only looked so unorthodox but had a uh, pretty unique story here. So I'm not an artillery expert, but I wanted to point out a few of the other guns here. So we looked at the 12 pound boat howitzers and Rhode Island was sporting James rifles. And let's see if we can catch it on the camera here. Just in the barrel there, you see the grooves. This would be a pretty much standard issue for the Union artillery forces here. Now the rifling in these cannons gave the uh, artillery pieces here deadly accuracy from ranges far exceeding the uh, smoothbore counterparts. And uh, we're gonna touch on how this rifling may have actually impeded the Union forces here uh, when the fighting shifted from Matthews Hill here to Henry Hill, which is in the distance right over here. Now, like we touched on earlier, the Confederate forces here were largely outnumbered. They were only able to muster a few regiments initially, and eventually they would also bring a brigade up to the field. But even with that brigade, they were largely outnumbered. Um, the Union forces numbered anywhere between 15 to 20,000 pouring out of this wood line behind you on the camera here. And uh, they, they never really truly intended to hold this ground. They were uh, fighting what was called a delaying action, a term that you're going to hear over and over again in uh, different battles throughout the Civil War. And they bought almost 90 minutes here. It took 90 minutes for a far superior force to drive the Confederates back towards Henry Hill there in the uh, background. Now, I almost forgot to mention this, <laughs> but once the Confederate forces were finally driven back after that 90 minute fight, McDowell would look over the field and he would claim victory, victory, the day is ours. And he was partly right. The morning didn't go terrible for the Union. They had overwhelming numbers. They just driven the Confederate forces back. But as we're about to find out, things were about to change pretty quickly here. All right, so on my way to Henry Hill, I made a quick pit stop to see this. This is the stone house and it's nestled between Matthews Hill and over here, this hill right here, over here, where's my hand, right there. Now that's Henry Hill. And this structure here is a stone house. And it overlooks the Warrington Turnpike and the Manassas Sudley Road, which was a vital artery during the time of the battle. And this house witnessed both the first and second battle of Manassas. And something that really caught my eye here was the carvings that were found in the wood floors here on the, uh, I believe in the upstairs, were done by Union soldiers who were kept here while they were wounded. So let's go have a closer look at this. So here's the front of the stone house. You can see the red flag waving there. Usually field hospitals uh, were marked by red or yellow flags. In this case, we see the red flag here. Again, this served as a field hospital during the first and second battles of Bull Run here. All right, so let's have a look and see if we can find those initials there. Uh, both, of, both these gentlemen were members of the 5th New York Zoobs. They were the ones that wore the bright red pantaloons. If you want to get over here, you can see it better on this side. Uh, this was U Eugene E. Gear, G-E-E-R. He was only 17. He'd only been in the service three weeks. He shot in the groin and unfortunately didn't survive. He died 30 days to the day from when he was wounded. On a little post it scratched in 30. He didn't get it finished, but that's 160 years ago next week. These two men were up here. Wow. Uh, he was a 21-year-old German immigrant shot in the foot. He did survive and they were able to save his foot, which was unusual back in those days. Uh, they did say he walked with a very distinct limp, but at least he had a foot. Uh, he was paroled from here, sent to the Union Hospital in Washington, where he spent about eight months. Discharged from there, went back to New York, got married, and lived until 1909. So 
That was cool. It's a good reminder of the human element of war. It's really easy to get wrapped up in the generals and you know the movements of their infantry regiments and you know taking a certain position. It's a good reminder that this house behind us not only witnessed the war, but literally took in casualties from this battle. Um, just seeing those names and hearing their stories uh, was was a good reminder of the human element of uh, warfare. It's just just a good reminder just how brutal war is. And this is why history is so important because these are the lessons we need to learn. And hopefully we can do everything we can to avoid war. Um, so I'll get off my soapbox now and uh, we're gonna head to Henry Hill now and uh, see how this battle progresses from Matthews Hill. So we are now on Henry Hill. And Henry Hill, you can see the Henry House there in the background. This is the position where the Confederates would fall back. They would fall back uh, back in this area here. And Matthews Hill, you can't see it from here, but it would be on the other side of the Henry House here. And once the Confederates were driven from Matthews Hill, Irvin McDowell took almost two hours to reorganize his forces. And that gave the Confederate forces enough time to organize their forces as well. And I don't know if you can see that statue in the background. Well, reinforcements have also arrived. So McDowell wanted to drive the Confederates from Henry Hill once and for all. So he would order two artillery batteries to move forward. This is the position of James Ricketts battery on the right of the Henry house here. And he would also order another battery under the command of Charles Griffin to occupy the left of the Henry House, we pan back over. So Charles Griffin would set up his guns to the left of the Henry House here. And total, they would have 11 guns on this ridge here, unsupported by infantry initially, which uh, both commanders would uh, move their batteries forward under protest because if you have artillery unsupported by infantry, it would make them a pretty easy target. And once these guns were in place, they began to duel with Confederate artillery pieces, I believe 13, uh, closer to that wood line there on the other side of the ridge here. Now here's one of the guns here from Ricketts Battery. This is a Parrot rifle. And they're pretty easy to identify. I'm no artillery expert, but anytime I see that giant brass ring right here on the breech of the cannon, well, I'm sorry, not brass, iron. It's an iron ring to reinforce the breech here. Those are Parrot rifles. And they were rifled cannons, exceptional at long range and highly accurate. Well, they were dueling against Confederate smoothbore artillery pieces, which uh, on paper, you would think that the Union rifled cannons would have the advantage. But these two artillery pieces are rather close. I believe only about 300 yards apart, which for artillery is uh, up close and personal, if you ask me. Now these guns, were meant for long range. So these Union cannon pieces here, they were having trouble hitting the Confederate targets. Most of these uh, shells from the Parrot rifles here would go far into that wood line above the Confederates' heads. And the smoothbore cannons for the Confederate forces actually excelled at close range fights. Usually targets at a distance, these smoothbore cannons would be at a disadvantage. But since these cannons were so close, the Confederate smoothbore cannons actually were wreaking havoc on the Union guns here. So again, we're to the right of the Henry House, and this is the site of Ricketts Battery. Now, as this artillery duel progressed, uh, Griffin actually moved two of his guns to the Union right flank. You see the visitor center there. Griffin would move two guns to the right flank to try and uh, shoot into the ranks of the Confederates. They call it enfilade fire. And essentially, now you're being hit from two sides, usually from the front or the side. But uh, yeah, so this is the right of the Henry House of Ricketts Battery. Now, let's move to the Henry House and talk about what happened here. So here we have the Henry House. And at the time of the battle, it was occupied by a woman named Judith Henry. Now she was 85 years old and she was what you call an invalid, which means that she struggled to get around on her own. So when the battle broke out, she was kind of trapped in her house. Now. The Confederates were occupying this position. The Union would bring up their uh, artillery batteries and they began taking uh, fire from Confederate sharpshooters and they thought they were coming from the Henry House here. So as you can see, it offers a pretty good view of the batteries here. This is Ricketts battery here. So they began taking sharpshooter fire. 
So they would turn their guns towards the Henry house and they would unleash several rounds of canister. Now canister shot is uh, essentially think of a coffee can and fill it with uh, ping pong size or golf ball size metal balls. And you put them in a cannon and once you fire, that canister breaks apart, essentially turning your cannon into a uh, giant shotgun. And they unleashed several rounds into the Henry house here. And one of those metal balls would strike Judith Henry and uh, tear off one of her feet. And she would uh, perish from her wounds here shortly after the uh, cannons opened fire on her house, making her the first civilian killed during the American Civil War, during the first major engagement of the American Civil War. So the Henry House before us was obviously restored, but we do have a sketch that was made by Captain Leon Frimo of the 8th Louisiana Infantry, and he would sketch this shortly after the battle. And we also have a picture from March of 1862 of the Henry House here, and you can see there's just nothing left. Again, another reality of war right here on Henry Hill. And just out front here of the Henry House lies Judith Henry, again the first civilian killed during the American Civil War, the first of many unfortunately. And she rests on the grounds of her home right here. So the initial fighting on Matthews Hill would take place around 10 a.m. Well, that battle would shift to this location, and around noon, uh, a man by the name of Thomas J. Jackson would arrive with his Virginia Brigade and overlook the scene, and he would see a disorganized Confederate force struggling against the superior Union numbers. So part of those reinforcements that would arrive with Jackson would be a group of men called Hampton's Legion, who numbered about 600 strong, and their leader, Wade Hampton, would be engaged in this area while the Union artillery was being brought up. And they have a few of these markers around the Henry House here, but Wade Hampton of Hampton's Legion would be wounded here on July 21st, 1861 during the battle, which is pretty interesting. And just to kind of reorient you as to where we are, here is the Henry House here. So the Confederates would arrive. I don't know if you can see through the tree here, but Stonewall Jackson statue is in that general area. And behind that ridge there would be his Stonewall Brigade, which didn't have that name just quite yet. And that's where he would position his artillery. Now he would have, like we stated, about 13 pieces of artillery, and he would position them on the crest there. And when those guns would fire, the recoil would bring the cannons behind the crest, and his crews would be able to reload without uh, fearing the cannon fire from the Union guns because his crews were behind cover. So you can see how the battle is beginning to evolve in favor of the Confederacy here. Because now, the numerical superiority that the Union had at the beginning of the battle was beginning to turn because McDowell just could not coordinate a successful attack. Most of his attacks that would take place in and around this area here were piecemeal. And what I mean by that is he would only be able to send two or three regiments at a time to attack the Confederate position behind the uh, Stonewall Jackson statue there. And once they would drive the Confederates back, they didn't have enough men to drive them from the field. And it would just be a seesaw action in and around these batteries here. And now we're gonna make our way to Griffin's battery to the left of the Henry House. And just before Griffin's battery, you have Colonel Cameron of the 79th New York Infantry Regiment. He was killed in this spot during the Battle of First Manassas on July 21st, 1861. Again, another reminder that in this area right here, um, men were losing their lives. So we're on the left of the Henry House. This is where Charles Griffin would have his battery. And shortly after Ricketts and Griffin's battery were placed here, McDowell realized that placing these batteries here without infantry support was a pretty big mistake. So he would move up some infantry support, again piecemeal, a few regiments at a time. And some of those soldiers, well, they were Marines. Almost 350 Marines would take part in this battle, and they would come up to support Griffin's battery. Now the Marines would initially be driven back by Confederate artillery fire, and they would pull back to the stone house where we saw the Union initials in the floorboards there, and they would make two more subsequent attempts to recapture this plateau. 
Um, although both attacks would fail, the conduct of the Marines at the First Manassas Battle uh, received praise from both sides. And something I want to share with you, when you have the first major engagement of a war, there's going to be a lot of firsts. We've had the first civilian killed, and now the first Marine Corps officer would be killed trying to retake these guns here on Henry Hill. Now we're going to head back over to Ricketts Battery and we're going to see what kind of infantry support he would receive and then we're going to head on over to the Confederate Battery and Confederate Lines and uh, get Jackson's perspective. So we've made our way back over to the right of the Henry House which would be the Union right flank uh, where Ricketts Battery was and we're in a location now, I don't know if you can see that marker behind me. Well, that's where a color bearer of the 14th Brooklyn would have been killed. Now, some of that Union infantry support would come up would be the 11th New York, which were designated the Fire Zwabs. It's one of my favorite infantry regiments. They were called the Fire Zwabs because they were volunteer firefighters from New York who answered Lincoln's call for volunteers. And they would all join the same regiment and they would be called the 1st New York Fire Zwabs, Ellsworth Fire Zwabs. Um, and in fact, uh, they were one of the first regiments to capture Confederate-held territory in Alexandria, Virginia, and a man by the name of Francis Barnwell, whose uniform is inside the Visitor Center here, he would uh, win the Medal of Honor. Now, he wouldn't be awarded that Medal of Honor until some years after the Civil War, but his actions were the first worthy of that medal. But anyway, bringing it back to the Battle of Bull Run here, the 11th New York, the 14th Brooklyn, the 1st Minnesota, they would all be sent in this general area to support uh, Ricketts Battery. And the Confederate infantry would take these guns. And this area would be the site of some of the most vicious fighting uh, here at the Manassas Battlefield. These cannons here would change hands three to four times. And the Union would rush up, take the cannons back. The Confederates would charge and retake the cannons. And this seesaw action uh, went on up until three o'clock in the afternoon. Now remember, Jackson arrived here around noon. So this fighting was lasting almost three hours of just hand-to-hand -hand combat, these cannons changing hands numerous times. And finally, uh, the 33rd Virginia, who were wearing blue plaid uniforms, approached these cannons here. And Griffin's guns did not open fire. They thought they were Union soldiers. And then the 33rd Virginia unleashed a point-blank volley into the Union artillerymen, devastating their ranks. They would take these guns. Now while that was happening, a man by the name of Jeb Stewart would take his cavalry and they would attack the flank of the 11th New York Fire Zwabs. Now they would repel that charge with a couple volleys into Jeb Stewart's ranks, but this was beginning to set up the beginning of the end for the Union here. They, they just couldn't get enough men at the right time to hold and take this position. The Confederate reinforcements, once they arrived, they were able to coordinate attacks much easier than the uh, Union could. And here are the guns that Griffin would have moved to the Union right flank to essentially get the Confederate positions here in a crossfire. Now you see the Stonewall Jackson statue in the distance there, that's where we're headed next. And the Confederates would be in this wood line here and their artillery positions are kind of straight ahead, but you can't really see them because of the rolling hills here. And here is more of the battlefield where you have Jeb Stewart's cavalry riding into the 11th New York Fire Zwabs, the 1st Minnesota, 14th Brooklyn, this is where they would be engaged at. And we saw on the other side of the visitor center where the color bearer of the 14th Brooklyn would be struck down and killed. But yeah, here is Griffin's batteries. Here's his caisson, which would hold his shells or rounds or powder, things of that nature. And uh, let's head on over to uh, that statue there. And before we head on over to the Confederate position, if I completely confuse you with my rambling, here is just an overview of the battle. You can see Griffin's guns there on the corner. We have the 11th New York, 1st Minnesota, 14th Brooklyn. You have Ricketts and Griffin's batteries. And you have all these regiments back here slowly making their way up. And you can kind of see the Confederate artillery positions where we're heading now and all the Confederate regiments in that wood line there. And then you have Stewart's attack on the 11th New York like we just talked about. All right, so now we are looking from the Confederate perspective and to kind of reorient you, there is the Henry House there. We are looking at Ricketts Battery. And here's the Visitor Center. Now remember, this wouldn't be here. <laughs> 
This is where some of that fighting would take place. And you see these cannon pieces right here. Those are Griffin's guns that he moved over to the Union right flank. And these are the guns that we just talked about. The 11th New York, the 14th Brooklyn, the 1st Minnesota, Jeb Stewart's cavalry riding into their flank. That was taking place all right here. And again, these are the guns that would change hands numerous times throughout the fighting here on Henry Hill. Hey look, there stands Jackson like a stone wall. Now who said those words? Well, this man here, General Bernard B. of South Carolina. He was the commander of the 3rd Brigade of the Army of the Shenandoah. Now his brigade was here and he saw Jackson arrive and he would run up to Jackson and said, they are driving us back. And Jackson would reply, then we shall give them the bayonet. <laughs> All right. So Bernard B. would ride his horse up to his troops. He would point at Jackson standing here upon his horse. And he would state, there stands Jackson like a stone wall. Let us rally behind the Virginian. Now there is some discrepancies with the exact quote. The other version that I've heard is there stands Jackson like a stone wall. Let us go to his aid. Um, I really don't know which one's true because unfortunately, Bernard B here, he would be killed on this very spot. He would be shot in the stomach and he would die the next day. Now there actually is some discrepancies, not only with what exactly was said with the quote, but what was the true meaning? Now we take this as a compliment. There stands Jackson like a stone wall upon withering Union artillery fire and small arms fire and there he is perched upon his horse. We take this as a compliment because that, that's how we perceive it. But there are some that believe that this, was, this wasn't a compliment, this was an insult. Um, Bernard B would ride up to Jackson. He would uh, state that his brigade wasn't in good shape and he needs help. And when Jackson would reply, we'll give them the bayonet, he would ride to his uh, soldiers frustrated and then said, look, there's Jackson standing there like a stone wall. So the other side of that quote is, look, he's standing there like a stone wall, not helping us. Um, again, we'll never know the true meaning of Bernard B's quote because he would be mortally wounded here and then die the next day. But here we are. There stands Jackson like a stone wall, observing the battlefield here and I'm sure it was in this general area, probably not this exact spot, but again, to reorient you, just how close we are, there's the Henry House, and there's Ricketts guns. So yeah, I wouldn't be standing here, so I guess uh, it was probably a compliment. So we've made our way back to the Confederate artillery position here, and here's where their guns were positioned. Pan back to the right here, you can see Jackson's statue. And in the distance there, you see Henry Hill. Now something else that's kind of sticking out to me is to the right of the Henry house there, you can see Griffin's gun. And in plain view, you have the Confederate guns here. So just giving you another example of just how close and intimate this artillery duel was. Like I said in the beginning of the video, I believe it was about 300 yards, which is ridiculously close when you're talking artillery. And the wood line behind us, behind the Confederate artillery position where Jackson and the other Confederate forces would be hunkered down during the Union artillery bombardment. And when they would assault the Union guns, emerge from that wood line there and over towards Henry Hill. And you can kind of see the rolling slopes here. And just before the Jackson statue, it kind of... Uh, the terrain kind of pops up there, which provides ample cover for infantry. So they can uh, emerge on the other side of this hill here, a uh, rather close distance to the Union artillery. So that was the Battle of First Manassas. Now obviously there'd be a second battle here on this very same ground, but we focused just on the first battle here. Um, coming here was uh, a really neat experience because you, you get a sense of just how chaotic this battle truly was. I mean, the armies were full of uh, inexperienced and green soldiers and you, you kind of get a sense of the commanders didn't really have a feel of what combat was truly going to be like in this war. Um, it was really cool sharing his story. The controversy kind of surrounding that quote, I didn't really know any of that, but hope you enjoyed this one and as always we're going to catch you on the next one.